Okay. Um, let's start, and uh, I will go through some stuff and wait. We can wait uh, for others to join as well. But in the meanwhile, we don't want to waste us time as well. Um, so, uh, who am I? My name is Salar. Uh, you might know me as Kurosh and uh, Discord. I'm a student mentor at OFSEC. Similar to you, similar to some of you, I got my OSCP certification. Then afterward, I joined OFSEC more than two years ago. Then I obtained OSWP, OSEP, OSWA certification. Right now, I'm on a mission to uh, mentor fellow learners, as I am also calling myself a uh, a learner as well, so uh, it's it's a huge blessing to be um, to be this uh, live spring and um, also have the chance to uh, have this live spring with you guys. So that that's uh, a little bit about my background. I think that should suffice since you already are here for the walkthrough. So then. Let's jump to it without further ado. I will just uh, share my Kali Linux and then we can start the streaming. This should be shared as well. I've already gone ahead and I'm connected to my VPN and uh, started x machines. So can we start? So let's run uh, nmap scan and see what comes up. We just use dash pn so that we know the host is live and running. We don't have to uh, wait for ICMP uh, echo request to confirm it. And we can say it scans all ports and then the IP address, and then we can use dash dash read them. I will try to speed it up by threading to four, uh, technique four, sorry, and then we can run the scan. It, it will take a few minutes since uh, I always suggest running a port scan before doing um, using dash A or dash S dash 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 S C or or anything else because you don't want to run. Um, deeper scan on, on the closed port. So we can confirm as we got a CNAC, so it means the port is definitely open. And uh, we have two ports at the moment, but we also need to check out the UDP scan. Since UDP scan requires pseudo privileges because it sends out data based on a specific protocols, let's say DNS. DNS is working on port 53, and uh, in order for Nmap to confirm whether DNS is being used or DNS is running, it sends data based on, uh, based on DNS queries that the target DNS server is uh, expecting. So that's why it requires pseudo privileges. So, we can just mention SU, and then we can uh, use dash dash top ports. We don't want to scan all, all the ports. So uh, let's go with 16 ports, and then we can mention um, the IP address and dash dash reason. Basically, this dash dash reason is um, showing us why Nmap determined if the service is up and running or not. Okay, we got closed and port unreachable. Port unreachable means the MMAP sends, uh, sends a data based on that UDP um, port. If it's a DNS, then it sends DNS squared. If it's DHCP, then it's data related to DHCP and it confirmed the port is definitely closed. So um, no important ports. Although I can say uh, Nmap didn't scan for FTP running on 
TFTP running on port 69. We can uh, manually confirm it. This is also one of the important ports. The reason being is that TFTP is unauthenticated. Everyone can uh, connect without any authentication. That's the main difference between TFTP and FTP. Uh, so it, it's very important. And sometimes um, in, in some routers, especially, it's enabled by default because they can get a backup of the ISO image or, or configuration file. And if you get lucky, and if port 69 UDP or TFTP service is running, you can push your own config file and you will get access to the entire network. And this is something to watch for. So do not forget to scan uh, UDP ports as well. So let's run it. It's closed. At least we tried out. Okay. So at this part, now that we know two ports are open, what we can do is that uh, we can run a deeper scan. How do we do that? We would like to run a scan to do fingerprinting of the services we found, and also some scripts that are available in Nmap uh, 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 scripting engine. So we can just say dash A, and uh, we can provide the IP address, and we can also use technique 4 to speed up the Nmap process, and then dash P to disable ICMP uh, request, ICMP probing. And we can just, uh, since we know the, the port is open, I'm going to just remove uh, dash dash reason. And let's run the scan. In the meanwhile, let's try to also open up the burp suite Okay, we got we got the results sooner that, than I expected. Uh, let me still open up the Earth Suite. We can see there is a SSH port. This is the SSH version. We usually don't have any exploit running on this uh, particular version, but we can always, of course, search it out. With with SSH, is um, what we can do at this point is to try default credentials, since that's the only move we have right now at this point. We don't have any usernames, we don't have anything. So, and also it's a good practice to, to see what are the defense mechanisms. And if there are any, if we get locked out after sending um, some requests or uh, is there any log, maybe we can discuss it with the blue team afterward to see if they manage to, if, if it's a penetration testing project. So um, yeah, let's let's do that. Let's first uh, focus on SSH. There is a great uh, package. If, if you guys haven't installed it already, please try to install Seclis package. Basically what, what uh, Seclis is, is a collection of multiple uh, you know, work list, security list, or, you know, different kind of cheat, uh, different kind of, uh, we can say for this, I think for this is a better term than security list. So uh, we can just, I, I can show some example of it. We are going to use it a lot. So please uh, install it. We can say locate sec list and let's grab what do we have for SSH. What, what did I mean by word list? So we can, we can see clearly that there are two word lists for SSH, top 20 common SSH passwords and default pass lists. Let's uh, explore them. Since we are going to perform brute forcing on an SSH, and uh, that's basically the only action we can perform at this point. Uh, let's let's check it out. So 
by observing it, this should be username and this should be password. So this is the format that this file is uh, written. So what we can do is, is to just use the same format. There are, there are two ways to go about it if you are going to perform brute forcing. Uh, one way is to uh, either, either use grep or cut commands to make one uh, username word list and one password word list, or use a tool uh, use a tool similar to Hydra, which supports this format. If you use dash C, basically supports uh, this formatting. Username, uh, column, uh, and password. Okay, so let's just use it, use the same. Use use Hydra for this purpose. Okay, and we can mention the protocol is SSH. Then the IP address. The IP address should be fifty two sixty. We can mention threading or let me run it. As soon as we run it, as soon as we run it, we get a recommendation or warning message uh, to use dash t only uh, reduce everything to four threads so it, it's it's a best practice that that was mentioned by hydra so let's let's follow it and use dash t4 to make sure only uh, it does brute forcing based on four threads and then we can maybe specify dash v to be verbose so that we can see what it does and then we can use dash f dash f if i could show it in here hydra dash hydra dash h um, Nope, uh, it doesn't have it. And we can say dash F. Basically, dash F is exiting the program, exiting the uh, Hydra. Once it found a logging, uh, logging credential, it stops. It doesn't go all the way. Especially, it can be used, especially if you are using a long word list similar to rawq.txt which contains millions of records or thousands of records. So it's a good idea to use this one, especially if you are going to use a long word. So we can just type dash F and let the Hydra be, Hydra proof forcing me. Okay. Now let's back to our, uh, let's back to scan in here and see what we got. So we got port 80 open. The web, the, uh, the web, uh, the web server is Apache and uh, the version is 2.4.41 and the operating system is Linux. This, this is kind of a misconfiguration because the web server, the Nmap scan should not resolve the version. It's it's too verbose. It's too much verbose. So um, this this should be mitigated, right? Because the attacker should not know the exact version at the you know initial the scan at least. So uh, because because it would make um, it would make the path for attacker a lot easier. To find real, uh, related exploits and vulnerabilities, so uh, this is something that should be mitigated. And how can it be mitigated? If you Google app, uh, Apache uh, fingerprinting prevention, This, this article shows up.
basically it shows um, different kind of mitigation techniques, how the information should be uh, hidden from attackers, uh, from attacker sites. So if you are using PHP, you can go, go ahead and, you know, make this uh, change in your hdphp.ini file. But, but since we are in Apache, let's just move to Apache. In here, in this uh, particular file, if, if we are working with Debian, Mint, or Ubuntu distributions, you should go ahead and, and uh, use server signature off. So what it, what basically the whole idea behind this mitigation um, is that uh, instead of showing this full Apache 2.441 and even the distribution, it just shows Apache and that's it. That, that's okay, that's okay. But it shouldn't reveal the operating system behind it and also the version number. This is not a great uh, start for, for attackers, for, for the defensive team when, when they are facing that. So, yeah. And we can see that it uses a CMS, and there is robot.txt file. There are the entries. And more importantly, it provided us with the version of that CMS. The CMS is Supreon uh, 4.2. So let's type it out. We can say port 80. We can say CMS is Supreon uh, 4.2. Then we can copy basically the entire information available here. Okay. Yeah. So we have them in here. And perfect. We, we already know the operating system is Linux because from both SSH scanning and also HTTP scanning, we realized it. But there is also another way to confirm it. It's, it's not a reliable method to use ICMP, but still a good method. So um, let's observe the TTL number. If it's something close to 64, then it's a Linux machine. If it's something close to 128, it's a Windows machine. If it's something close to 255, it's a, uh, it's a um, usually Cisco device or, or some router. So let's let's try it out. This was the IP address. The TTL is something a number close to 64. So basically this is also another indication. But uh, we, we, we could see uh, Okay, these are the information we got so far. Let's let's send a request to it to see what, what we get. Let's send a curl request. Interestingly, when we saw a raw request uh, to the to the uh, target web, web application, we get two uh, two or three status codes. Uh, status code. So uh, usually three hundred uh, three hundred codes are redirection, whether it's three or one or two. So one of them is being permanently redirect, meaning that this application was. Uh, permanently re redirecting to another point, another uh, endpoint, or uh, it was temporarily redirected. We can see the same information. We can see the cookie. This is also important. Sometimes, sometimes we can also, uh, what time you 
of information from this cookie section, uh, we can understand what is the backend uh, language that we use or uh, what CMS is, CMS is being used in there. So, so far it doesn't reveal too much, but uh, we will see later on as well as we need to perform more throw testing. So uh, nothing in here, but we can see the uh, location header. So it's redirecting us to this particular website. I'm going to just check, make sure I don't have any entries in here. I will just remove this in entry uh, since I added the previous this live stream. And let's just send, uh, let's just browse this in our in our uh, browser. I, I'm using Chromium Bundle Browser in their suite. So let's let's open up the IP address to see it in action as well. Um, we can say one on the sixty-three. Okay, we we get unknown host. Why do we get it? Because we cannot resolve this name, and uh, this this is also um, this is also a good starting point to ask ourselves, what are we exactly doing here? Why are we being redirected? And, and what is the technology behind it? We can suspect virtual hosting is being um, used. What is virtual hosting? Virtual hosting is a technology that whenever you have multiple websites, let's say you have offsec.com, you have offsec.local, you have offsec.internal, okay? You have multiple uh, websites hosting on a, on a single web server. You have only one public IP address. How, how all of these uh, domains are being hosted on a single uh, IP address? The answer is virtual hosting. Using virtual hosting technology, we can have domains on a server. But uh, that also begs the question, then how does the web server know which resource we are uh, connecting? So uh, are we going to connect to offsec.com, offsec.local, internal? The answer is if we go ahead and check out, uh, is the font also uh, okay or is it too small? Can everyone see the fonts clearly? Yeah, okay, okay, excellent. Then the fonts is good as well. So we can say um, virtual hosting. I think it's because of Hey, uh, it's not. Let me search it in here. I think in here I can just translate it or don't have the extension, I believe, in here as well. So let's see. Okay, I think this should be the language. Display language should be in 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 English now. So this one, and now let's research again. Okay, great. It's this this resource I've read it so I this should be a good uh, resource 
to check it out. Let's see the IBM documentation. I want to show you a sample uh, virtual hosting to have a better understanding. Probably a wrong resource, maybe this one. Virtual hosting. Digital mission. Okay, uh, this, this is what I was referring to, excellent. So this is a sample virtual host configuration file. I will zoom in a little bit. So the, the web application is running on port 80. The document root is word www.html. It could be something else, usually when, when you're purchasing uh, uh, host services from uh, from hosting uh, providers they will they will give you access to a certain folder so your folder would be if, if let's say I own offsec.com uh, domain I purchased it I hosted that web application they will give me access to this one this is going to be my root document meaning everything under here are going to be my files or the web pages that I'm I'm uh, hosting. So yeah, basically that's what uh, root document is about. If there is another customer, let's say uh, example, this uh, this example company has access to only this particular directory, okay? So, yeah. And usually there is a tag in here of server name. Uh, based on the server name and server alias, web application expects uh, a name. You know, you can mention whomever is called com, whomever is requesting offsec.com, redirecting to this path. Okay, if someone is uh, asking for, uh, let me mention example.com, redirect them to this particular endpoint, to this uh, root folder. Okay, everything uh, under here will be shown for whomever uh, requests this okay how how is the request being sent that's a question um let's actually discuss is how do you detect virtual hosting is being enabled or not let's let's see the answers maybe we can go through them and discuss it Uh, Kenny Canville, DNS. Okay. Uh, let's, let's hear others as well. If, if any got any suggestions. Let's, let's give it just one more minute and then I will explain uh, the process behind it. If, if someone else wants to jump in, feel free. Okay, 
fire terror. Excellent, excellent. Yes, yes. Also there, also there. The reason why I uh, emphasize on this particular topic, when I, when I was putting the machine to live stream, one of the items I immediately picked from the virtual hosting, how it can detect, because it's being used a lot in 210, 200 courses, and this is one of the most frequently asked questions. And I wanted to provide more clarity on this particular topic. So um, the answer is not DNS, but, but the answer is uh, host header, and I will uh, share why. So if you can see, this is, this is an internal uh, web application. So it's not hosted on the internet, but it's rather on the on a machine that is hosted in the PG ground. So, uh, yeah. And, and if we talk about host file, okay, I don't have anything in here as well, right? Let's let's try host header. Whenever we are sending a request, let me intercept my request. I will intercept my request. Okay. Uh, this is even small uh, size for me. I can't even see it. So let me quickly fix the issue. Or search font. Let's go with 20. Okay, I think it should now be more visible. Okay, but I don't want to, okay. Yeah. Is it visible now? Okay, okay, excellent. Then, uh, we can see the, these are the H, these are the headers. Whenever whenever we are using browser behind the scene, what what basically browser does is to send out and uh, compile this whole request on, on our behalf. However, whenever we are trying to uh, utilize tools or send requests, let's say manually with tools called uh, like Netcat, okay. We need to provide this information. Basically, this is how HTTP request is, um, look, looks like, okay? So this is the host header. And let me send it to the repeater. If, if I send the request, I will get uh, 302, right? And if I follow the redirection, I won't get anything. I will just get uh, it, it uh, you know, af after a few seconds or a few minutes, it just pre presents me with an error, okay? But let's let's try this one. Let's, let's try this. Let's say I'm sending a GET request to this IP address. But let's modify the header. We can say modify to x filtrated dot offset. Okay. And it, it, it won't work immediately. I will mention why. I will just run it. Let me just maybe use dash i so that we can only see the status quo. Oh, oh it, it works because, because yeah, I. Yeah, it, it didn't follow redirection because they used the, uh, I modified the header. It, it now shows a resource in use. Let's remove it. Let's remove it. It shows 302. And if we follow the redirection with dash L, care could not resolve host. But I, I'm not using a DNS. I'm using 
it's basically simple. I'm just modifying uh, the host here, but I'm still using the IP address. So there is no DNS involved. I, if you check out my host file, even by the way, this one is finished, nothing was found, but it still is, is an issue because if, if there was no log created or and uh, since since they didn't kick us out, I think this is an issue. So uh, there should be a security mechanism that just fail to ban to block us from brute forcing SSH. Um, let's check out my host file. There is nothing here about exfiltrated.offsec. Okay, but why um, why does it result? When, when we enter it, it's because uh, we are connecting uh, connecting the IP address, but this is the, this is how we can uh, check out if the virtual hosting is enabled or not. If the resource is being loaded, it means there, there is something, there is definitely something, okay? When, when you are using DNS, when you are using DNS, it, it would also work, it would also work, but this is not a correct way to go about it, and I will share one. Let's just add in here, uh, exfiltrated.offsec. Uh, it will now work if I just mention exfiltrated.offsec. It, it will now work. But what, what, what happens, my question to you is that when you are using DNS, um, my question is that what happens to multiple virtual hosting? It's not only exfiltrated.offsec. Maybe, maybe there is exfiltrated.local. Maybe there is a.exfiltrated.internal. You, you probably can't guess or know if virtual hosting is being um, used or not. The only way to go about it uh, is to, you know, first try to see if, if it, it works by manipulating the host header. See, but the reason why it works when you add single entry is because when, when you are sending the request, uh, the host header being sent is automatically points to uh, exfiltrated that offset. So that's that's why instead of seeing the original one, let's see in here, let's see uh, in here, instead of the IP address, if you send exfiltrated.offsec, Then the website loads. That's that's why whenever you are working on the on the labs, you can. There is a suggestion. Please add this to your DNS. But but consider that if you want to uh, check, discover other uh, other virtual hosting uh, uh, domains, you could use. GoBuster or other tools to fast them. That's how you can do it. You can double fast and then add a fuzzer, a fuzzer keyboard here and then provide maybe uh, exfiltrated.fast. And then you can see what other uh, virtual hostings are available. Enough about uh, virtual hosting. Let's move on to the to the actual stuff. So I think I already added, added the uh, entry in here. From now on, whenever I I point to exfiltrated.offsec, it will reflect back to this one. So let's check out the web application. We can see now we, we can see the resource being up, uh, being shown to us. At this point, we can take two approaches. One is to fingerprint the web application, and the other one is to fingerprint uh, a web server. Let's, let's 
start by fingerprinting the web. We can say what uh, web. This is a great tool, by the way, um, which is going to check out the technologies and everything running on the web server. We can just say exfiltrated for offsec and specify dash V. The name itself is very self-explanatory. What web? What, what is behind the web application? So, yeah. Okay, it it um it detected the title. It's powered by CMS. And let's come down. Ubuntu Linux. Sometimes it it might show some other uh other piece of information. Okay. But it seems like that's not the case. We could also use Apple Excel for the same purpose. Let's move on to fingerprinting the web application. In this particular web application, it's a CMS basically. Testing CMS is completely different than testing other, not, not completely, but we can say it's slightly different than testing other web applications. Usually, usually there are two ways to approach CMS. One is to find vulnerabilities on a core of the CMS, okay, on the CMS code itself, or, or the second approach, the other alternative, or other way, if, if you may say, is to focus on plugins, themes, and usernames. Since it's very difficult sometimes to find vulnerabilities on, on the core of the application, the second, uh, the latter would be more, um, more successful in, in most cases because anyone can write a theme or plugin, publish it, and many users will uh, install it. And most of the times, maybe it won't be tested as much as it was, uh, as much as the core of the, that CMS was tested from the security perspective. So uh, we, we can try to do both. And the other thing is that whenever we are, CMS, especially with open source ones, we can try to check out the source code as well. Rion CMS. The title in here should provide the version. Yep, basically 4.2. If if the version wasn't specified, we could just check out the comments. Uh, sometimes in the comments there are indication of the version, or you can check out the JavaScript or CSS files to see what's running, and. Uh, but but in this case, since it's already in the title, uh, that should be okay. We don't need to spend too much time on it. But let's go to the GitHub. I will just use Google Chrome since uh, I can search the results based on English keyboard. Suprion CMS GitHub. We could, we could and we should perform DIR busting with GoBuster or any tools that you prefer. But an easier way and more accurate way in some cases would be to just check out the GitHub page. You know, you could start uh, start running faster to find robot.txt. But if you can check out or install the applications locally, you could already see what, what directories and files are available by default and make a, a list of these instead of you know running a, a lengthy scan. Of course, there might be some additional files you could not that fade, but as a starting point, you could already uh, see some of some of the files like TXT. I haven't performed uh, 
they are busting, but I already know that um, maybe license the txt exists. Uh, maybe a typo on my end. Robot the txt we saw it. I don't know if I make a type made a type or not. Let's check it out. Yeah, license the txt exists. I could have run uh, Robuster, but since since I already uh, checked double checked with the with the GitHub repository, I could keep that part as well. Another way, let's say if if it it wasn't uh, Supreme CMS, it was it was another um, another CMS. We, let's say it was WordPress. What we can do is to look for list of plugins or things lists within setlist package. So even if, if I'm trying to fuzz WordPress CMS, trying to perform DIR busting, I could perhaps check out the uh, check out this particular uh, this particular maybe word list. These uh, directories or files usually are common in, in most WordPress applications, or we can even, I think if we filter out based on uh, not WordPress, but maybe based on CMS, it provides more lists. Like if, if I want to see what plugins are available and try to access, I could grab this particular word list, okay? And we just can, you know, uh, utilize this when, when we are running Bluebuster or other tools to find out which plugins are available. Similar for the things as well. And uh, for for other well-known CMS, uh, there, there is something in here as well for Joomla, for uh, or let's say I think I saw Cold Fusion and other ones on Braco. This this is also very famous. For for the yes, Cold Fusion is in here as well. For Suprian, I couldn't find anything. I might have missed it. But but it doesn't really matter at this point since we already can see the source code. Uh yeah. So let's let's check out the different uh, different resources. There is a backup, there is admin. I'm guessing admin and uh, admin should point out to a login page, but we can check it further. There is upload directory, which definitely seems very interesting. Oh, there is HD access file. HD access file, uh, is a configuration file that sets the settings for um, current directory. Okay, basically it it shows uh, what what type of uh, application or extensions should be running or allowed or denied. In here we can see that PHP, PHP five, PHP four, PHP three, and and some kind of, some extensions are not allowed. Because of the uh, danger it possess, so this is this is a very important piece of information. Uh, in in IAS in IAS, the similar file exists called web.config. So if you come across web.config, it's similar to HD access in, in Apache. And and regarding going back to the virtual hosting. The same concept almost exists in IAS server called the IAS name binding. So be aware of it. And let's click around and see what we can find uh, ourselves by going to the website as well. And we also want to check it out. We maybe we can't find any members in here. No members. So. Uh, no members in here. 
at this point, whenever we are targeting uh, themes, plugins, and users, I already showed uh, how we should enumerate things and, and plugins. Basically, we can go through that repository. Supreme CMS uh, GitHub. We can see the templates in here. Let's see what, what is installed. Kick start. I, I, I know there might be, uh, there might be a, a, a template called uh, kick start by default. Let's see if there is any plugin installed. So can we find any plugins? Let's see, plugin. No plugin directory. We could we could act, um, actively perform GoBuster to find out, but but let's start with user enumeration. We discussed we should also enumerate users, right? So let's let's try that one. We already click around and saw members in here, but there is no member, right? So let's see if there are any reg registered. No, if we can search it. See, admin, admin. How does this work? No. Okay. No, there is no user in user in here. Maybe check out the blogs. Maybe someone posted the blog. We could perhaps enumerate users in here. No, that's not the case. Another way, another way to check, check the users is to um sign up some some resources are only available for uh, for authenticated users so let's see not auto generate a password d8mh capture code incorrect email is incorrect so email based on the based on the domain name I'm going to use the same format because I believe that that should be the email they are expecting. So, um, or or it could be since since it's a sign up, it could be any email. But when we log in, maybe that that could be something uh, something related to this domain. It, it depends since it's an internal application. So let's I capture. I'm very bad with these captures, by the way. I hope I pass it. Okay, member register, thank you. Uh, your account password has been sent to this email. Uh, let's see if if I can connect to it. I don't think so, since if they are saying that account password is being sent to that email, yeah, either login or password is invalid. Let's, let's see. Exfiltrated but offset. My bad, I provided the wrong email. No, it, it doesn't allow us to log in. And since, since this is an internal application and we do not want to use our Gmail or something, uh, that's probably not the path. So let's let's try another thing. Let's see. Forgot password. Let's let's click on this. Forgot password is usually a great indicator because we can try to test, let's say, test.filtrated.offsec mkbdu or let's say Salar. I, I'm using my name because I know this user definitely doesn't exist or I'm really unlucky person. So let's see how the application uh, behaves. No members registered with this email address. Okay, so for users, if, if the users um, don't exist, this is the message we are going to get, okay? But let's check out some random users. Let's say admin, okay, CD827.
Okay, we can see now that uh, the user indeed existed because it mentions we have sent the confirmation code. We know there is a user called admin at sign. There is an email uh, for admin user and the user will be admin. So we know this user exists. This is a good indicator. But I'm going to also show you some more advanced technique. Um, it might work, it might not work. We're just going to try it out. So uh, please bear with me with uh, this, this one. We can go to the login page. Okay, we go to the login page. We already know username admin exists. So we are just going to test admin, some, I don't know, solar, just something completely random. And let's intercept the request, okay? So the use the username is admin and the password is Salar. Let's send it out. Okay. And let's this time try. Um, in here, it doesn't reveal if the user exists or not. So they've done a good job of not revealing the admin user. Ex uh, exist or not in this particular login page because it doesn't show some some uh, CMS systems may mention uh, this user uh, the password is incorrect meaning the username was uh, right but if they mention the login and password is invalid that that should be still fine because uh, because uh, it doesn't reveal whether the problem was with the password, but with the user. So they, they did a pretty good job in here. It doesn't show us. But but uh, let's not leave it as uh, leave it um, because of that reason. Because I'm going to do a technique called time-based uh, user enumeration technique. I will explore uh, explore what that is and, and how we can go about it. So. We, we send the request to our admin user and let's try with a user doesn't exist, Salar, Salar. Okay. Let's, let's compare these two together as well to see uh, what, uh, what we can Check, let's send them to the comparer. And compare. Maybe the response, I should have sent them the response. Uh, remove. Okay, sometimes, sometimes there might be a differences between the words or bytes. Whenever uh, you, you send a request, okay, but, but, uh, in here seems like there isn't any differences at the moment, but let's try something else. Uh, what is time-based uh, time based technique? What is time-based uh, enumeration technique? In misconfigured web, web applications, whenever the username is correct, but the password is not correct, the response time will be taking more time uh, than if you enter both of the information, username and password correctly. Why is that? Because if the web application is getting the username and then uh, goes and um, 
you know, hashes the password and then compare it with the database, it takes some time. This operation takes some time, okay? Let's say mm, a couple of milliseconds or a couple of seconds more. That particular time frame can be an indicator if the attacker uh, tries to monitor the response time and they could understand uh, you know, which users uh, exist and which user doesn't exist. Let's say time um, user enumeration. Let's Google this one. I believe this article should be good. So, and, and, and we will replicate it in this one in here. But since the, uh, I think this gentleman, uh, the web application, he was more, uh, the response time had it was more obvious. I would just uh, check this one. So this is a user. Uh, so one time it this gentleman uses true, and one time it uses false. If you compare the timing, this one took this uh, first one took one thousand fourteen milliseconds. Okay, when when the when the um, condition was true, meaning the user existed. Okay, but when the condition was false, it only took ten milliseconds. So basically, it was an indicator based on, based on time. he could know which user existed and he uh, which user doesn't existed, and. We can try to do the same thing in here as well. So let's let's try to uh, admin Solar. Let's try to intercept this request. I'm going to intercept it, send it to the repeater to monitor it. Uh, okay, this is 178 milliseconds, right? This is for admin user. We know admin exists. Let's use a user that doesn't exist. Solar. 96 milliseconds. Let's say test. 93 milliseconds. Interesting. Uh, there, there is a gap between the users that don't exist and the user that does exist. We can see 93, 94. But if you use admin user, 144 milliseconds. So this is a very advanced technique, but very efficient when it comes to enumerate users available on, on a CMS or any application. So something to keep in mind. And uh, the only way to mitigate it is to use a timeout. So the timeouts based on uh, to randomize everything and make sure the user the correct condition wouldn't have a huge gap between a, a false condition. So we can see this gentleman provided some uh, some suggestion here based on timeouts. Uh, let's scroll up a little bit here. Set the timeout. Okay. Even if the user that does not do not reply immediately, wait for a few seconds. I think Subrian CMS did a pretty good job because the because it not it it is not as huge as um, what we saw in this article. Um, but but still there is a huge gap. Um, not as huge as, as the original posting here, but still there is a gap. So that's that's another way to confirm it. It's not as, as reliable as uh, password forgot, but uh, yeah, but yeah, you, you definitely could use this to your advantage as well. Um, we have we have a login page. There is not much we can do in here since we cannot uh, post anything, not authenticated. And these are social medias. Uh, nothing I could see in here. 
maybe term of use policies. Let's see this one. I believe there should be just some static content, uh, nothing interactive that we could utilize to our advantage. Okay, I think I forgot to turn intercept. Okay, now they should load up. Nothing here. Nothing about us. Yep, nothing in here. Since we have the password functionality and also um, and also the uh, login form, let's try to think of the uh, first uh, first credential that we could think of. Whether it's admin password or admin admin, we could try our chances, or we could perform brute forcing. Since we know the uh, we could use intruder and then. Um, Basically, let's let's try to do that. Let's say Solar and then turn intercept on. We could send this to the intruder and then perform uh, brute forcing on this particular uh, logging form. Okay. Uh, but, but before doing that, before doing that, since it's going to take some time, let's also check out the CMS version as well. We fingerprinted the web application, but um, what if what if there is a core vulnerability? Let's, let's check that one as well. We discussed there are two ways, core vulnerability, or um, we should enumerate users, themes, and plugins. Maybe there is a core vulnerability, we could say, Supreme CMS. Okay. Seems like there are some vulnerabilities in here, after all. So maybe the core of the um, the application is vulnerable because if we check out our nodes, Supreme 4.2, 4.2.1 4 might have something interesting for us. These uh, this group might not be interesting because the version is lower, but let's check out the one that is the most interesting. You, these, these are client-side attacks. What we are looking for is maybe something that gives us uh, an access to the target machine. Arbitrary fi uh, file upload seems interesting. So let's also Google it out to make sure we don't miss anything else as well on other resources. Uh, so I think I forgot to turn the intercept off. Now it should be okay. Sorry, file upload. Let's see the GitHub page. Oh, there is a Metasploit exploit as well. Interesting. Um, yep. Let me zoom in a little bit so that you guys can see more clearly. File upload bypass to RC authenticated. It means we should have um, access to the, to the admin panel first, meaning uh, it kind of hints that we should have valid credential. Um, let's let's check out this one. Let's check out this one as well. There is an exploit. Uh, okay, maybe source code. Let's try to read the source code uh, quickly. Okay, it's an it's again authenticated uh, one. So basically, by performing user enumeration, right? Because it, in order for these exploits to work, we should have a valid credential, so we didn't just um, fe uh, fell into a rabbit hole. So, uh, okay, and username. True, by default, it uses admin, uh, which 
in our case, the username was indeed admin, and the password, it uses admin if, if it's not specified. And then there should be a URL, URI, and endpoint called panel, target URI path. So if we search target URI, this is the base path. path. So we can say test.txt again. So this should be the base path. And then if we go to um, panel in here, this will be appended to the base path, which is the root one. So this should be the path we are uh, checking out. And then, uh, okay, it performs authentication, it appears. And then uh, it shows the status is obtained CSRF token and starts uploading. Uh, the web shell somewhere. Yeah, we should have access to the admin panel. So let's try the default credentials provided in here. Admin, admin. Oh, it worked. Uh, it, it actually worked. So uh, yeah, we are in. This is also a very bad security practice. The developer should not have used uh, weak credentials or guessable credentials at least. So this is not a very great idea to use that. And it, it's pretty common, honestly, to see weak credentials being used, especially in other development projects so, and, and internal ones. If it's a web, a web application um, under construction still, you may have a chance to uh, to use the weak credentials or guessable credentials, and you might have, you might find your access. Usually, when it comes to CMS, uh, because of their functionality, there is always a way to uh, to uh, inject some uh, to inject a PHP code, whether whether in a certain page or upload a plugin to get a reverse shell. So, or or they might use templating engine. You could use SSTI, for instance. So there are usually some ways to um, try to get a shell. Let's go to the panel since uh, the exploit was referring to this path. And we could also see the Python version. Python version is also easier because I think everyone is more comfortable with Python than, than a meta split. We can do a side-by-side uh, -side comparison as well. So, yeah, it goes to, this is the base path, and this is the upload directory, we saw it. And then, okay, this is the panel. This is the admin panel, great, interesting. There are a lot of options in here. Um, let's go to the settings. Maybe there is something in here. Nope. We could we could upload some files files in here, but let's see a schedule tasks. Um, no, I don't think I can add something. I'm not sure if I can edit something either. Yep, it's it's pretty much not doing anything. If I think I click on, okay, it launched this task. I don't want to launch anything yet. Yet, maybe database. Okay, we can uh, issue some queries, but let's also check out the content because we might have some chances to up upload something in here. Okay, we we could edit these pages or. Oh yeah, there, there is an upload directory. There is an upload directory. If we also check out the exploit, there should be a URL upload. It should append this URL. It should append this URI to this URL. So uh, the path definitely makes sense, panel uploads. So let's see if we can upload the file. 
Um, okay, we can certainly upload file. Let's test. Echo solar to solar.txt and then we can uh, select the files and go to the PG exfiltrated solar.txt it seems like the file has been uploaded double click it okay it shows the content open it, it shows just the content where is it being uploaded though that that's very important preview okay preview is in here so it doesn't do um, anything interesting get information in plain text okay this is the path excellent this is the path this should be the link i can already see it here as well if, if I hover my mouse, but it's not panel, it's uploads to the TXT. So let's open it yet. Yeah. This would display in here. This is the path. Uh, we will talk about uh, mitigation strategies. I will provide some resources. But the initial thing, uh, the initial mistake is that the name of the file is exactly as I uploaded it in a predictable uh, location. It, it's on, on the on a um, root, web root document, okay? It's it's under uploads folder. This should not happen because I could now upload the web shell somehow. And I'm guessing based on the exploit we saw, they are doing the same thing. So let's let's check out the exploit. Let's see how the person is uploading his uh, his web shell. Okay, here, here is the PHP code. Here's the PHP code, and uh, the shell name is something.phr, phar, far. Far basically, if we see far, uh, I can say PHP far, similar to jar, but whenever you upload a verb suite, you will get a single file called uh, verb.jar or verbsuite.jar. Basically, it's an archive file, but whenever you run it, it's, it's only a single file, okay? Compiled in a, in a single file. Whenever you run it, verbsuite will load. If you try to down, download a version that, uh, down, download the version manually and want to uh, run that version, same, same um, concept applies for FAR, uh, which is, also on kind of like an archive file. So yeah, but but for PHP language, and meaning if you want to run, uh, to give someone a single file and whenever they run it, they can uh, run the whole application within a single file, you could use far format. So let's go back to HD access. We mentioned there are some restrictions uh, based on the extension, right? So let's go back to it. Let's see. Uh, let's see the HD access file. Let's see the upload one. We should check in here. I will open up the issues in here as well. Far is the, uh, is also in the deny list, right? But but if we go to the issues, since this version is um, one version after the one that we are working and it's already patched, but at the time that the, the author wrote the exploit, he's, he was using the same version as us, 4.2, not 4.2.1. So let's see if the author uh, perhaps reported it in here. Uh, Assignment vulnerability, PHP code, menu items, data. Mm. 
not in here. There are some mentions about XSS. Let's see. Let's see if there are any references in his or write ups in his uh, code. Oh, yeah, there is. There is this one. There is this one. Let's see this issue. Let's see, there is this issue. Okay, this is the original writer, the, the original founder of, of this um, the exploit. What he did was uh, he tested PHD and FAR uh, extensions. And at the time, the HD access file was looking like this. So um, FAR and, and uh, .phd file weren't included. So uh, meaning the extension blacklist that, uh, that was, was used was insufficient because there were some ways to get around it. Whenever we are testing file up, there are generally two great resources. One is OWASP and the other one is uh, Hacktrix. I strongly suggest going through this one. There are many um, many ways to test uh, test test the file upload because usually the restrictions are either based on the content type or based on the uh, based on the extensions. In here, the restriction was based on the extension. So let's let's see some examples when when uh, there is a, there is a restriction based, based on the extension you could use these extensions whenever you are dealing with php if it's asp this one or similarly for other um, technologies or web programming languages usually far is one of the um, missed options so or, or you could use techniques such as a dub, double extension, png.php. Basically, in, in Linux system, or when, whenever you're dealing with Apache or, or web servers in Linux, they consider uh, this as the extension. From They read from left to right. But in Windows or iOS server, it's quite reversed. Whichever extension added in here will be the considered um, extension. So you could also obtain a list of um, list of extensions, whether by going through this list and and why why do these uh, extensions matter? Because because there are some ways to go on the web by adding some um, characters. I'm, I'm not going to discuss all of these because uh, it will take um, many hours to go through all of them. But but null byte uh, is a character that whenever you get a null byte character, whatever comes after it is completely lost. Okay, so this is one uh, one of the, uh, how shall I say, ways to bypass the extension uh, restrictions. So let's, uh, let's, let's now go back to the original exploits. We know the person used uh, for um, so let's we try to do the same thing as well. Nano, let's say solar dot, or not, actually not solar. Name it something that the developer don't suspect it. So, so you have a higher chance of being uh, undercover. You can say system dollar get. Solar. Okay, so this file is a PHP file, right? And um, and this is this is a simple backdoor. We can name it language dot um, language dot far perhaps. And now. We can see it's it's still a PHP file, okay. But what if what if there there was a restriction based on based on the content? What if uh, on the backend the backend checks the application type, okay? Whenever we are uh, uploading a file, let's let's see 
I think I have it in here. Uh, I will just remove all of these. Okay, let's not try to do that. I will just delete everything in here, create the history. And let's upload the file. Okay, it was uploaded, but if we go to the verb suite, the content type, um, content type, this is a form, by the way, this is, the, that, that's why uh, it's mentioned for data. So, uh, okay, the content type in here. Application octet string. We have many different kind of uh, file types. You could get a list of them by again using uh, our great sec list. So we can say applic content type. What if we could spoof the content type? We could say it's not a PHP or a, a plain text a file or whatever. What 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 would happen? There are there are many files. Let's say we, we can't say it's a GIF file. We could replace uh, we could replace the content type field uh, uh, in the verb suite in here. And sometimes if the if the backend the application doesn't check it manually and trust our content type tool, it will pass it. You know, it will bypass the restriction based on the content file. Okay. But let's let's even move further. Let's say, let's say on the back end, there is something I'm just simulating it. It's not it's exactly quite similar to this one, but let's say there is a tool called empty tool. That reads the metadata and headers to see what is the uh, what is the file that we are dealing with. Let's say language.php. It shows the file type and file uh, file type extension my type, the one that is uh, being used. So, uh, what if what if we can uh, what if there is a checking system? How can we bypass it? There there is a there is a great concept called magic byte. Magic byte. What magic byte does is that by adding a few, few, uh, ca few characters and headers, the the my type and everything will will be shown differently. So meaning, uh, let me show you. Uh, let me provide you an example of it. Uh, okay. This is the link. You could also search it list of file signatures. If, if you Google it, you can you could see the uh, the magic numbers of magic bytes. Whenever you this at the beginning of your file, the the tools that, that are being used to detect whether uh, what, what is the mime type? What is the file type? Can can be bypassed. Let's say we are looking for this file. If we add this this uh, this particular string, we say language of PHP. We added this one. File language of PHP. Now. Even though the extension is PHP, the file type is uh, considered GIF image data. That's that's the beauty of it. But but um, there are many other techniques, and there are many more mitigations. We are 
we cannot possibly cover all of them. But the whole concept is either um, the restrictions are based on uh, content type or based on extension. Sometimes you need to combine all together to have a successful um, outcome. And, and one more thing, uh, whenever you're testing a viable vulnerability, this is not a great way to go, although we can confirm whether we successfully up uploaded the web shell, the web shell was uploaded correctly, but, but this is a very bad idea uh, as a penetration to sort of bug bounty hunter, because you are putting the um, customer at risk by uploading this web shell. Why? Anyone can access it if, if they have uh, if they authentic it to the application, or worse, if, if you have um, on, on, on an authenticated file with vulnerability, then that's what everyone can access it and everyone can execute it. What, what should you do about it? Uh, there is a tool called um, Reefly. Basically, it generates um, a PHP web shell, and it comes with some benefits. Uh, generate, we can say, we choose a password and a name. Let's say Salah, that's far from using it. Uh, what it does, this tool, solves two, two problems. If AV is, uh, is antivirus, like um, our simple web shell, it has some encoding and obfuscation techniques to get around the uh, antivirus detection. And also, also, it secures our web shell, meaning whoever wants to connect to our web shell should know the password. That way, no, uh, not everyone uh, is capable of, of, you know, um, accessing our web shell. So let's let's just uh, CC our file. Okay. Uh, yeah. If you can see, it's an obfuscated file. So it's the content. Um, intentionally was obfuscated so that it would be difficult for the AV to pick it up. So let's upload this web shell. Let's upload this web shell. We can delete whatever we have uploaded. Let's quickly try this one. Okay, we called it solar.far and we can where is it? This should be the URL. Now we should use Vibli game to connect to that particular web shell by providing the IP address. So if I provide the IP address, I, I now have access to it. But if you see the browser, I couldn't access to it or I couldn't do um I couldn't run any commands because I'm not authenticated. So yeah, basically it doesn't show anything. Uh, we can say system info. There are a lot of modules. I, I highly suggest checking out this uh, project. It's a wonderful project. There are many similar ones that basically does the same, same thing. So um, we have now kind of uh, not an interactive shell, but a web shell that somehow mimics the shell, reverse shell. But let's try to get a reverse shell to stabilize everything. So I'm just using this payload, but you are free to use any other payloads you wish. Let's say IPS ton zero. I want to see what is my IP address. My IP address is this particular IP address. That um, VP, we started our listener. We can say this is P address, and the port number is 443. And then we can just this one, and there we go. We got a shell. Okay, excellent. Uh, so we got a shell at this point, and the final code was successful. 
Regarding the mitigation strategies, I will put over the uh, listing here. The file upload doesn't doesn't only lead to uploading a web shell. There might be some other kind of uh, attack vectors you can utilize. You could utilize file upload with, for instance, um, with command injection. You could use it with SS, uh, SSRF. And those were covered in, in uh, file upload attack learning module. I highly I could recommend uh, checking it out. It's, it's a very useful and interesting learning module. So this is this is one of the subcategories, this very broad category. And we are only talking about um, uploading a web shell. So please bear that in mind. And uh, let's say mitigation or mitigation or prevention. I believe it should be somewhere in here. Okay, let's let's check this resource as well. One of the famous PHP functions is get image size that uh, checks checks if if the if the target file is indeed um, image or not. But but there are always also the better. That's why I suggest going through the OWASP, going through the, all of the list, not just one, one uh, and make sure you test all of these cases one by one. This is not a probability automated. You need to test it manually. And okay, in here, prevention methods. Again, we cannot cover all of them, but we can cover some. As I mentioned, uh, there is no coincidence if someone tried to upload the file, there is absolutely no coincidence if someone is trying the file name he's uploading is containing these characters. So he's probably chaining another vulnerability with file upload. So these characters should not be um, should not be used, and there should be input sanitization and input validation. So also the tags and etc. Basically, basically. Uh, Input validation, uh, yeah, and and the file types. Instead of using blacklist, it should be only a whitelist. Whitelist is always a better approach. Only the ones that are useful for us, not allowing uh, anything else. And what what initially the developer failed was using a blacklist. That's how the uh, security researcher originally. Uh, pointed out the issue, let me see, yeah, here, the reason of this vulnerability, HD access, that, that was the main issue. So, yep, and let's go through the, uh, some, some other examples. Oh, and by the way, by the way, the most, mm, most important than all of them, the uploaded file should not be uploaded in, in um, web group documents or documents that be, is being hosted on, on it. There could be, let's say, war temp, or it could be in dev SHM, SHM or any specific um, directory, but it doesn't have to be in somewhere where they, where they upload it. They can access it and they can get a shell. So uh, this this is very important. Uh, if if you if you are a developer and you are you need this functionality, I mean, uh, almost many websites use file optional option, whether for uh, resume, uh, submitting resume, for uh, profile picture and etc. But it should not be. In a in a path that is accessible by the user, and they can you know access their web shell after being uploaded, and the file name shouldn't have been predictable. 
the user should not know what is the file. I already knew what was my file uh, was called language that for. So this is this is another uh, point. And yep, upload the directory should not have any execute permission. The code should not get executed, and uh, yep, sometimes sometimes it's just not in a form of um, a file upload form. And uh, you have a button, you have a submit a button or browse button, and you can um, send a resume or something. Also, it could be in a form of HTTP request method, like poop, which is very dangerous. So, by going through this list. You could also notice that many of the uh, topics we discussed can be mitigated, but all of them should be revised. So this is this is how it should be uh, mitigated. Let's let's uh, also try to escalate our privileges since we are in here. I'm going to just quickly link this. App install piece. Okay. Um, yep, let's Let's start the Python web server. We have the file in here. Or not. Actually, let me check out the piece. We install the package. The link piece in here. Okay. This should be this one. DP share list. Link piece. Link piece. AMD 64, or am I using the wrong naming? Yeah, I'm using the wrong name. You can say lp.sh, copy to the current directory, and then we can host the file, think Python web server. Um, transfer the file, we should go to a directory that we have a uh, write permission. What are the directories we are word writable um, directories? One is temp, if you check out the temp, anyone has access uh, to write access to it. So let's go to the temp, we can say, let's also spawn TTY shell, although this shell should work. Checking my IP address again, real quick. We can send it to piece.txt. Let it run. It may it may take some time. Basically, um, let let's see what the automated tool will do, and we can also go ahead and uh, perform some manual uh, integration after. But we should not only rely on this tool. But uh, since the recording is already long. I'm going to also quickly um, mention a tool uh, in here that we, are, we can use it. Uh, there is a very interesting tool. I could suggest everyone checking it out. I, 
after this one, or if you're following around, you can do this uh, on your own as well. The PS Buy tool, the concept behind this tool is that sometimes there are some uh, time jobs or scheduled tasks that normal users don't have access to them. And, uh, but this tool will, um, will uncover those uh, scheduled tasks. How? Basically, it uses an API called iNotify. Man, iNotify. And since this API doesn't require pseudo privileges or having high privileges, it could uh, monitor which file being, is being, are being accessed in user temp and different directories. That's how, if any changes happen or the file being accessed, then um, PS5 can monitor it, can, can see what, what's happening uh, behind the scenes. But by default, it's not possible to see a schedule task. So it's kind of like a workaround. If you also read the original author's um, original author's uh, explanation, he mentions uh, he mentions his angle. Let's see. I believe in here uh, he mentions it. How it works? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Basically, for for taking out um, root schedule tasks, you need to have root privileges. One way is to also check out the or scan the prop directory, but it's it's kind of um, resource consuming. So he uses I notify API for for that matter and to monitor these uh, temporary files or log files or uh, library files. So uh, that 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 is how this tool works, and uh, the output should be similar to. Uh, Let's, let's see the GIF file. And link piece scan has finished. This is how it, it would look like. UID zero means uh, root. And if, if that runs, let's see. It shows what, what uh, tasks or what uh, files uh, are being accessed or what tools are being run. So keep in mind, you could test it out. The, it should be very straightforward. Let's, let's try to also quickly test it, this one out as well. Was being downloaded. Already downloaded too much. Okay. Documents PG exfiltrated. It's coming here. Let's upload it. Okay, we can see there is a task being uh, run by uh, by root users. By root user, basically, it runs this particular S, S, um, script, image.exif.sh. Let's see if it's being run again or it's a one-time thing. I hide me doubt it, but let's see. So nothing in here, but we should give it a moment. In the meanwhile, I will try to uh, I will try to 
yeah, this has been uh, happening every, no. I will try to get another shell. I will try to get another shell with quickly. Seems like every minute is happening. Mm, take a look at this time frame for 1959 and it's uh, 1950. So every every one minute this task is being drawn. We could wait another minute or we could just kill this one and we could say, let's connect to Vivli again. Let's get another shell. Say B, K, you can say this one. Okay. Uh, I will also, in the meanwhile, I will try to transfer the result of LP.sh. One thing, one thing I can do, I don't have um, privileges. Let's see if I have access to Python. Python 3 is available. Uh, let's say 8080. Okay, I backgrounded this, um, this process, and then on my Kali, I could perhaps send a request and say uh, piece.txt, piece.txt, dash o, output.txt maybe. Okay, it's because I, I'm using port 80. Let's try port 8080. Yep, try port 8080. Okay, we got the file. We got the uh, output file. Now let's try to use more, uh, go over it. I think because of the colors, it may cause some problems. So we just need to go through it. Uh, output.txt. Oh, wow. I think there, there was a problem indeed, or no. Ah, it's because of the coloring stuff. I could have probably ignored it with default options. Uh, or less, we can check with less as well. It's interesting. So the output wasn't generated correctly. Interesting. I I think. Oh, okay. With more, it shows. With more, it shows. I remember now. Okay. Uh, we can use more to see the coloring and everything. So we can scroll down a little bit. Basic information. We, we can see the kernel version. If it is vulnerable, GCC is already available. Perhaps. Your current user is www data and writable folder is dev.sechm and thing is available, bash is available, and C is also there. So see system information, it's Ubuntu 2.20.42. Uh, so sudo version is might be vulnerable. You can check that out. Um amount of files. Let's see. The Linux exploit suggested suggests this is vulnerable, but um, kernel exploit should be the last option because it makes bugs um, and 
the, if, if you are performing a live engagement, be very careful with that because it makes the whole um, computer server and to not function properly. If, if you don't know what exploit is doing, and usually that's that's um, most most of the time that's the case because it performs uh, and interacts um, with, with the kernel itself and um, it might not always be a great idea to uh, go for kernel exploits first. So let's go other avenues first. And then if we don't find anything, we can come back. We already saw uh, sudo version is vulnerable as well. Let's see if we got any processes, interesting processes here. Nope, seems pretty default. Binary process permissions. And, and the reason why I'm scrolling too fast is because after getting used to reading uh, um, this whole um, link piece output, you could already tell some of the information is not important. All they are red, but they are not really. Some of them are just default and being tagged as uh, important findings. So that's that's why I'm skipping them. So, yeah. Let's see. important yet okay this should be interesting because it's talking about uh, what we discovered so this is the environment variable bash opt image bash exif.sh so basically root is running this scheduled task or uh, basically, root is running this this uh, this grid. Let's see, let's see the interval. I think it should be one minute. Cron job online. We use all. Okay, at every minute. Yes, we can confirm with this side. We can. Um, Confirm by both going through the whole PSPI output and also checking out uh, link P's output uh, that the task is being run every one minute. Let's just scroll. Okay. Network information. Maybe there is an internal service. We don't have access. We need to do a port forwarding or something to get access to it. Networking, network information, host DNS, this is the DNS, interfaces. Yeah, MySQL is being run. I, I know it's MySQL because uh, based, based on Memorizing the port number. It is three, three, 3306 is definitely um, MySQL. Uh, okay, but it's being run internally. That's why that's why it doesn't show up um, at first. So whenever you are in a situation that the internal service is being run, you need to see if there are any avenues you could utilize or um, to perhaps escalate your privileges. You know, maybe you could connect to MySQL, obtain hashes, or load. Uh, if, if it's MySQL, you could um, use UDF um, to also escalate your privileges. Basically, it's kind of like a, a loading uh, a UDF file. And based on that, uh, let let actually explore it a bit further. UDF privilege escalation. 
user defined function. Uh, This one. This one is a good idea, but let's see what is UDF file. User defined function. So let's see if this one as a better explanation, I think this this was one the one that I originally when I was studying for two hundred back in the day I I was going through this uh, particular article. So uh, with with UDF you could execute some extended codes, um, and it's it's like a library that that when you load it, you know you you could utilize it, and and if if an attacker manages to load a malicious UDF, what happens is uh, they can they can uh, get a, they can uh, execute code as well if the mysql is running as a root user okay it is it's very important the the mysql service is not the um, the one that you use credential for connecting to mysql service mysql service the um the mysql service being run uh, with root user, then if you manage to load UDF, a malicious UDF file, you could escalate your privileges. So something to keep in mind regarding this one. Um, but so far, the most promising one is a that bash script. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's check that one out. Check that one out. The reason why I... Uh, Use this one in the background is because I don't want to do my shell. So, and afterward, you can just build the process as well. Um, so, let's see that that file was running. Uh, it should be in Opt, I believe. Opt. This is the file. Image exif.sh. No, oh, I am in the, in the temp directory. To the old and this one. Okay, what what does it do? So uh, it uses a bash script to to use exif uh, to collect exif metadata. Exif two. If, if we search out EXIF tool, what is EXIF tool? It shows that this tool is being used to uh, collect and manipulate metadata. It's just not for collecting. You could use uh, EXIF tool on the, on the examples we, we discussed earlier. You could see that there are metadata. This is a file type GIF, which of course we know it's not. I mean, it is kind of being shown as GIF file, but at the end of the day, it, it's a, a how should I say, PHP uh, code inside the GIF file. The GIF version is uh, 87.87a, and, and this is the mime type. Whenever you want to post or uh, send a post request to the web application, this is what is being shown. So uh, it, it's show, it shows that GIF uh, active tool is being used in web application as well. So let's see. Yep. Exif tool is being used. So let's let's read the script though. Uh, okay. This is the path for the images. It's var www html stoprian uploads. This is the directory and uh, these are the metadata we saw earlier. Uh, when when we run when we run ls it's the metadata in here, and then we just randomize the name of the file. So using metadata and and the file name in here. 
So it then, the images are in this directory. So it runs ls command. One, one suggestion as always, whenever you are trying to break down a script or something, just write it down somewhere, write it in here. Instead of images that just use hard coded value for debugging it, so it should be w HTML Supreon uploads. Okay, then grab for the JPEG file, and while doing it, perform exif two on the this one, this path, and the file name was something random, right? And and just uh, append it to this file, to the log file. What is the log file? The log file contains uh, these two, but that's not important at the moment. We understood that exif two is being used, okay? And since this is being run as as a root user, we can manage to somehow exploit this. We can get a, a root root shell. So the version is eleven eighty eight. So let's Google it. Exif two. Maybe there is a vulnerability with this uh, tool. Exploit. Okay, there there seems to be an exploit. Uh, the case study. Yeah, if if this version is vulnerable, then that version will definitely be vulnerable because it's lower than this version. So let's try to find the CDE ID. CDE ID is this one. So what I'm going to do is to also explore. DB website. We can use filters, advanced filters, and we can say the CVE number, exit two, and let's search for it. Goes up. There are two documents. One is the exploit code, and the other one is this research. It's probably a good idea to read the papers. Oh, there is empty. Let's download it. Okay, it's a PDF file. It's a PDF file. So let's try to open it. It's too much. The uh, font size is very big. So I will try to. Make it smaller. Improper neutralization of user data in DJVU file format. So there is a file format called uh, DJVU. DJVU file format. This file, file format is used for uh, scan files or graphic file, uh, graphics file format. So um, some something to keep in mind when when you are reading that article. Format exif two versions uh, seven point forty five and up uh, up allows arbitrary code execution when parsing malicious image. So, if we somehow uh, make a file format, uh, we make a file with this file and force the exif two to execute it, then uh, we can we can have a code execution and at the end and the end we should get root shell. Why? Why? The reason is that uh, we saw that exit tool is being run every one minute. So what, what we should be doing now is to make one, make one uh, DJVU file. So let's see what the author did and maybe we could replicate it at this point. So this is the metadata. Uh, okay. Let's come in here. Uh, let's call it 
what do they call it? Let's let's follow his, his instructions so that we can replicate it exactly as what he next step. We exploit let's let, let us call it exploit as well. Where did I use it? Uh, GD exploit. And whenever you're uh, copy and pasting, please be aware of these quotations. Some, most of them are causing issues because especially for Mac users, uh, the quotes and, and uh, the single quotes and double quotes are completely different. So let's let's change this one. Let's let's even change the payload. I'm going to uh, set uh, use plus s to change the permissions to set UID um, of the owner of bash file. Let's see where is bash file, which bash. So I'm going to ch change the um, change the permissions by default. By default, a root user has access to has a write, a read, and execute access on, on in Bash. Everyone else has only read and execute. So let's let's try to change it, and we can say let's set the UID bin, and okay. Okay, and let's see what was the next instruction was. DJ. DJ VU make and uh, exploit name. I, I will copy and paste this one with, with your permission because um, it's going to take some time to go back and forth. So I will just uh, paste this one. Uh, okay. This is going to be the name of the output file since we are making this. And by the way, if you don't have this um, application installed, it's very straightforward. You just can install the package. Uh, maybe how to. But this, this should be the name of the package. Whenever you are trying to install this on, on Kali machine, it's very straightforward. You can just run uh, sudo install, then the name of this package. Then, then it should work. Okay, so we can just paste this one, and there should be a file called exploit.djvu. Okay, but since since it refers to the original exploit, uh, this one, since the a script reps only for JPEG command. Although the file is, is, we can confirm it exit tool itself again. Although the file is uh, based on DJVU file format, we are going to rename it to uh, JPG for, uh, JPG extension because that's that's um, based based on the scripts. It only grips on, on that that one, and then it will loop over. So um, for that matter, we need to change the file and. Uh, Rename the file. We can call it uh, uh, exploit.jpg, perhaps. Now, since we know where the path is going to be, the path is going to be on this particular directory, right? Because we saw images and then file name. We should upload an image in here. So let's try to do that. And hopefully, first we should have access 
to that right access to that directory. So let's check it out. If we don't have right access, then it's not going. To, it's not going to work because we cannot uh, write into it. Okay, we have a right access. We have right access. Okay, so let's try to move to that directory pretty quickly, and then. Upload the image file that we hosting. We are hosting on our Python web server. Exploit .jpg. and then we can we can call it exploit.jpg. Okay, and then we can say slip or face say date, and we can say a slip sixty seconds because it's it's. The scheduled task was going to be run every 60 seconds or one minute. So let's, let's sleep. This, this was a long session, but uh, I didn't want to cut out some of, some part of it. Um, so especially with virtual hosting, uh, pen testing, DMS, there, there were a lot of topics and, and file upload. So hopefully it, it was an um, interesting session for you. And the last part should be only escalating the privileges. And, and we covered uh, how, how the PS1 works and uh, you know, um, how can we even see the scheduled tasks that are not visible to the normal users? If we check out the permissions on the user being bashful, excellent. It is now set to, uh, we can now see, see the S in here. So in order to prevent uh, this flag being stripped, we can use dash P. And if we run id command, we are a root user. And in order to confirm it, we can just uh, root proof.txt file. We can see that uh, there are 33 characters. The last character is backslash n, which is a new line. And there should be a hash of uh, md5 hash, hash because it's 32 characters. Um, so we obtain the flag and we escalate our privileges. We can do some other stuff with persistent and etc. But but uh, that that should be the end of it. So uh, yep, I will just move back to my slide and we can talk further about it. Uh, yep, and and the mitigation for this one should be very straightforward. You should up uh, update your um, exif tool version so that that's 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 the one thing and and um, yeah the other the other mitigation that we should have considered is regarding the uh, brute forcing the login form there was no uh, there was no capture there was no race limiting so it allowed us to perform brute forcing so we guessed it and the other important piece of information is regarding the uh, V credentials. That was also something that should have been mitigated. So series of uh, chaining, uh, series of vulnerabilities lead to what we are now, rooting the entire machine. Let's now move back to, uh, move back to our, uh, our slides. Just, just to wrap up what, what we did uh, in this uh, session, in this live stream, we discussed methodologies to approach CMS testing. We explored exploiting the credentials. We explored uh, file upload vulnerability tests, abusing cron job, 
And ventral versus mitigation strategies for all of the above and even beyond when we talk about how to prevent um, web server fingerprinting. So um, with that being said, there are two announcements I will just quickly make. Um, the first one is blog post challenge. Please refer to this uh, message for further instructions. Basically, uh, from, from what I uh, read and, and what I understood is that you could uh, share a review of, of your goals in 2024 and etc. And the other one is uh, the, how you are using AI. So if you could participate in this survey, you will get a uh, $15 uh, discount on, on offset plan. So yeah, please participate. And the last one I want to mention is um, thanking my great colleague of Phoenix for creating this box, this box creating, uh, created by him. And I got the permission and his blessing to um, to uh, use it in the live stream for this. So thank you, Naki Inox. I really appreciate it. And last thing, if you have any more questions, I'm one message away in Discord. I you can see me literally in Discord every day. Um, so if there is any doubts or any questions, feel free to let me know. Uh, the fi final wording um, is that one thing I noticed uh, from my feedback being two years, more than two years at OFSEC is that if you could answer three questions, what, uh, why, and how, you will learn every topic. And e even when, when you're working on a course material, you are trying to solve a challenge lab, if you could answer, uh, find an answer to all of these three, then the path would become clear. Uh, so please try to find an answer for all of them, not just two of them, not just one of them. And that's it. I really appreciate you join, um, joining this live stream. It was wonderful. It was my first time, um, but I enjoyed it. Uh, thank you so much. Wish you a lovely day, night, or even further. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.